Welcome back. So for this lecture, we're going to be focusing on vowels. So we talked about the consonants in the, in the International Phonetic Alphabet, and we're going to be focusing on the vowel symbols in this lecture. Um, and there's a reason we haven't talked about vowels yet, and we'll talk about um, why vowels act a little bit differently and the way that we describe them and how that's distinct from consonant sounds. So we did talk about consonants last time using this chart, which shows the English sounds that you need to be familiar with in this boxes, um, where the ones towards the left of the chart are further front in your vocal tract, the ones toward the right are further back, where the rows are organized so that the upper rows are more closure in terms of manner, so plosives have complete closure, and then less closure, more open, um, with things like approximants at the bottom. <clears throat> and then the two sounds in the same box referring to left being voiceless, right being voiced. But when we move on to the vowels, we do have a system for vowel sounds as well, which you'll notice on the handout. So if you don't have the handouts handy, now is a good time to grab those and have those with you as we go through these together. But the reason that we want to talk about vowels now that we already have a system of symbols to look at is largely because vowels are very unobstructed in the mouth. So we shape our entire mouth in different ways to produce these vowels, but our oral tract is mostly open throughout the production of vowels. So it's very different than consonant sounds, which tend to have a very specific and minute changes to create different consonant sounds, vowels are much more open in the oral tract and in our vocal space, and so we don't have the same way to describe them as minutely and as specifically as we do with different consonants. And so when we start looking at the symbols, um, you'll notice that these are represented also by individual symbols, and some of them similar, look similar to different sounds that we have in our spelling system. But again, the spelling is going to be very confusing. There's a lot of symbols in the IPA that look like English letters, but are often representing different sounds than what we typically think of them in our spelling system. And this is largely due to the historical changes over time from the time we created our spelling system until today, where a lot of those sounds have changed. So when we look at the chart, and I want you to focus on the American English chart on the English page for when we're looking through all of these. And this chart was created specifically for American English to highlight only the vowels that you're going to need to be familiar with, to focus only on the vowels that we see in American English. And the reason this is important is because if you look at the full vowel chart, you'll notice that there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of descriptions, there's a lot of things that are next to each other. It can be very busy and it can be very overwhelming, and it includes a lot of symbols that we're not really going to see in any of our examples. So rather than be overwhelmed by a description that doesn't really fit the way we talk about vowels in English, use this chart instead to focus on the vowels. And this is designed also in a similar way to the consonant chart, where if you think about turning your head towards the side of the left side of the chart, the further front sounds are on the left, the further back sounds are on the right, and then the height is listed there as well. And we'll talk about those distinctions um, specifically and individually in a moment. So when we think about vowels, we have four different ways that we describe vowel sounds that are distinct from how we describe consonants. So with consonants, we had voicing, place, and manner to describe our consonant sounds. But with vowels, we have four different dimensions that we're using to describe these in terms of their phonetic descriptions. We have backness, height, tenseness, and rounding. And these are generally referring to the placement, the comportment of your tongue and your lips when you're making a sound. So they're a little bit broader in scope than the ways that we describe consonants. And we'll go through each of them individually and talk about which English sounds are fit by these different descriptions. But first, I want to give you some examples of each of the symbols that you see on that chart and some example words for them. And it's going to be very helpful as you try to pinpoint which vowel refers to which sound because they're going to look different than how we spell them very frequently. Your book has a list that's similar to this. Some of these came from that. Um, but having these example words is going to be very helpful as you're practicing. So I highly recommend if you're creating flashcards, if you're studying with these, to include some of these example words um, as best you can to keep in mind the sound that's associated with it. So when you say, for instance, the word beat, you know that it's represented by that E sound, the short capital I. And that'll help you as you're honing in and as you're studying these different sounds. So to start with that first one, what looks like our short capital I is actually the sound E in words like beat, bleed, see, each. The next one that looks like a short capital I um, is our I sound. So in words like bit, in, flip. The next one that looks like our letter E, the lowercase letter E, is actually the sound A. So these are words like bait, late, 
rain, anger, play. The next one down that looks like a sort of backwards three, our, our lowercase epsilon, is the e eh sound in a word like bet, egg, friend. The next one down is supposed to be a script A tied together with a lowercase e, and it's important that these are touching and that they're one single symbol, because you'll notice that those individual symbols are also separate vowel sounds. So rather than it being interpreted as two different vowels, you want that to squish together to look like one single symbol. Um, and this is known as an ash symbol. And this is an a ah sound in a word like bat, apple, happy. <clears throat> the next one, oo, is our lowercase u, so that makes the oo sound in a word like boot, soon, true. The next one that looks like an upside down omega or a horseshoe u is what it's sometimes called, is our u uh sound in a word like book, put, hood. The next one, o, makes the o sound, so this one is actually pretty similar to our spelling system, in a word like poke, mode, so, odor. And then the next one, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but not all American dialects use this sound. So if you're from the Western United States, and especially from the coast, you're probably not going to find this sound very often in your dialect. So this one is known as open O, or sometimes a backward C. And this is an aw sound. So if you're from New York or the East Coast, a word like water would use this sound, or coffee would use this sound. But we don't really see this very often in Western dialects. So there's a little explanation for this in your book as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But for most speakers, we're using the next symbol down. We're using that low central ah sound um, in order to make that sound. So instead of using that open O, most of us are going to just be using that ah sound for everything. So in dialects that do make a distinction, the open O word caught would be different than the ah sound caught. But if you don't have that distinction, then both of those would just sound like that ah sound below it. So caught, rock, awful, bra. The last two we'll talk about a little bit more later um, because the distinction for these is a little different than the distinction for our other individual vowels. Um, but that first one that looks like an upside down V is what we call a wedge. And this one, it makes an uh sound in a word like but or above. And then the last one, the upside down looking E is what we call schwa. And this is also an uh sound, but this is a very relaxed sound. So it's, tip, it's sort of our default low um, high frequency sound that doesn't really take as much effort to produce. Um, so this one is above, about, berate, the uh sound. Um, if you've ever watched Bob's Burgers, that uh sound is the sound that Tina Belcher makes very frequently. It's sort of like the sound you make if you just open your mouth and make noise without actually moving anything around to do it. So that gives you an example of words that correspond to the sounds. And then if we look at the features for these sounds, the first one we'll talk about is backness. So vowels are described as being either front, central, or back in American English. And we refer to this as backness. It could easily have been referred to as frontness, but backness was the term that was chosen. And we have some back, some central, and some front vowels in English. So our back vowels in English are u, u, o, and o. Our central vowels are the schwa and the wedge, and then our central low a. And then our front vowels, e, 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 and a. So we have some in each of those categories. And if you look on the chart, you'll see them falling into those separate columns. But with backness, there's actually a little bit more variation between dialects um, than some of the other sounds that you might see, especially that low central ah sound, which on your chart looks like a script A, and that is the more accurate symbol to be using. Um, the font here ended up messing up that sound. Um, and it's, this one tends to vary a lot more than other vowels by region and by speaker in American English. So in California and in West Coast dialects, it's often closer to a non-script A. It's a little further back, but still low. Whereas in the Midwest, it's a little further front than in other areas. So if you think of Chicago, it's not an ah sound like some people use when they're making fun of a Chicago accent. It's not Chicago but Chicago, where it's a little bit further front in the Midwest than what other speakers would be using. In West Coast dialects, that open O sound, the aw sound, is very rare. And in some speakers like mine, like me, um, this is essentially non-existent. So there are times where you will find this, and the little book um, excerpt um, will talk a little bit more about this. It, your book was written by um, UC Santa Barbara, so it has a California focus on that. Um, but when you do find this vowel, 
um, it's typically only in front of liquids. So in a word like California, you might find that sound because it's in front of an R. Um, but typically that ah sound is the replacement for it in dialects that don't actually use it. So you'll most likely, for many of you, will be using that ah sound, the script A um, or the non-script A, in order to convey that sound in your own dialect, even though some of you may have that ah sound natively. The next one, height, is going to be something that if you compare the English chart that we will be using in class with the full chart, you'll notice there's different descriptions. And this is very important because in English, we only make three height distinctions in the tongue placement in our mouth. We have high vowels, we have mid vowels, and we have low vowels. And that's how we're going to talk about them and that's how we're going to describe them in the class and throughout the semester. So our high vowels in English are e, e, u, and u. We have several mid vowels, so a, e, uh, uh, o, and o. And then we only have two low vowels. We have a and a. And you'll notice that when you're making these with a high vowel, your mouth is sort of closed off. It's much higher. You're raising your jaw. You're raising your tongue. So when you make an e sound, you may notice that your mouth isn't open very wide. But if you make an a sound, you're lowering your jaw for low vowels to make those sounds, to give more space in your vocal tract while you're making them. And this is one reason why a doctor will say open and say ah, because it's opening your mouth the widest of the vowels that we have and gives them a chance to actually see into your throat. Whereas if they said open and say e, there's really no space to see anything. So it's you're lowering your jaw, you're opening your mouth more for those low vowels than you would for those other ones. The mid vowels are sort of more neutral. You're not really lifting anything. You're not really dropping your jaw. Um, it's a little bit more um, relaxed in your jaw to make those sounds. The next one, tenseness, is an important one to focus on in English because this is a distinction that we make in English, but that a lot of languages don't specifically make. There's other ways to describe vowel distinctions in other languages, but tenseness is a very valid one in English. So we have tenseness as a distinction in your chart. You'll notice that the tense vowels are listed in the white on the outer part of the chart, and then the lax vowels are listed in the gray on the inner part of the chart. And the difference here is exactly what it sounds like. It refers to how much tenseness is in your jaw. So if you tense your jaw to make it, you can have a tense vowel. If you relax your jaw, you have a lax vowel. And we have a few pairs that are exactly the same except for that tenseness distinction. So e and i are both high and front vowels. And the only difference between them is whether or not they're tense. So if you make an e sound, you might notice that you're sort of tensing your jaw, you're spreading your tongue in a slightly different way. But if you say i, you're not really moving your mouth from that e sound, you're just kind of relaxing your jaw a little bit. So e, i, e, i. Or e and e, same kind of thing. You tense for the a sound, but not for the e sound. For our back vowels, we also have the distinction between u and u, and then o and o where the only distinction between those is whether they're tense or whether they're lax. The central vowels that we have, the schwa and the wedge, and then the low vowels that we have, a ah and a, ah, don't have a tense or lax counterpart. They're all considered lax vowels because you're not tensing your jaw specifically for them. And then we'll talk in a minute about the distinction between um, the schwa and the wedge because it's a little bit different than this tense or lax distinction. But the only tense vowels we have are e, e, u, and o, and all of the rest of them would be considered lax. The final main distinction that we have for vowels is rounding. And this is a distinction that happens with your lips. And you can see and you can feel the difference when you're making an unrounded sound versus a rounded sound. So if you say the word beat, 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 you can notice your lips are sort of spreading out. It's almost like a little smile that you're making when you say that word. But if you say the word boot, you still have a high vowel, but it's now a back vowel and it's now a rounded vowel as well. So you can notice that your lips are sort of pursing together and creating a rounded shape. So this is where that term comes from. And most vowels in languages of the world have both a rounded and an unrounded counterpart. And so that's where some of that clutter comes from on that full IPA chart where there's a rounded and an unrounded version in each of those different spots on the chart. But in English, only our mid and high back vowels are rounded, well, in American English. The rest of them would be unrounded. and But this is a distinction that you still want to be familiar with because even though we don't have as much importance to rounding because our back vowels are rounded, everything else is unrounded, 
This is a very important distinction in other languages. So in French, for instance, they have a high front and tense vowel E, but they have a rounded version of that as well, E. So whether you're saying E or E, it changes the meaning of a word. So they have those two distinct vowels. So rounding is still important in some languages, even if it's not as important of a distinction in American English. And then finally, those last two vowels, the mid-central vowels we have in English, these are both described as mid-central, lax, and unrounded. But there is a distinction in how we produce them and where we produce them. So the most common one is our schwa, the upside down E. And this one is occurring in unstressed syllables in English. This is sort of our default vowel. So when we're not stressing syllables, we're using that, that sound very frequently. If you have a mid-central vowel that is stressed, then it's usually realized as that wedge. And so the distinction here is based on stress rather than based on tenseness or lax. And a lot of times we'll use schwa even if a full vowel quality isn't schwa. So we tend to replace vowels with schwa if they're not in stressed syllables. So we can test this out by comparing some words. So in a word like Canada, the stress in there is in the first syllable, Canada. And so that first vowel, when you say Canada, is an ah sound. And then the other two vowels would be schwa because those are in unstressed syllables. But if we say the word Canadian, we're now switching the stress to the second syllable. And that a ah sound in the first syllable is now schwa because it's not stressed. And that second sound that was schwa in Canada is now an a ah sound in Canadian because it's in the stressed place. So you notice a difference based on if it's stressed or not because you'll use the full vowel in the stressed syllable but not in the unstressed syllables. So schwa shows up very frequently in a lot of words, even if you don't think about it in terms of the spelling. Another example is a word like above. So the stress in above is in that second syllable, above. And so this word actually has both the unstressed and the stressed version together in the same word, where the uh in above is going to be unstressed, it's schwa, and then the uh in above is going to be stressed, and so that one would be wedge. But this can be a very difficult distinction to hear and to make um, noticeable. So as long as it, you're transcribing one or the other in this class, that'll be fine. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about syllables and stress. So you can use either one in place uh, as long as it's supposed to be one of those two, and it'll be fine. If you do want to test yourself out and try to put the, sh the wedge where it's stressed and put the schwa where it's unstressed, you can test that out. But as long as you have one or the other, you'll be okay. Schwa is by far the most common, but you will have instances where wedge would be more appropriate. The last distinctions that we'll talk about are combinations of vowels. So just as we had different affricates for consonants, where we're combining two consonants together into the time of one sound, we have the, these vowel combinations as well. When two vowels are doing this, when they're functioning together as a single sound, we call this a diphthong. And so these are going to be similar to affricates where you're moving your mouth very quickly between the two sounds. They function as a single sound. A lot of speakers think of it as a single sound. But it's going to actually be two sounds that we're just moving rapidly between. And we have a couple of them, and these ones do vary a lot by different dialects. But the ones that you'll find in dialects of American English, um, there's three main ones that you should be familiar with, and then we'll talk about two others as well. And these three main ones, you kind of just have to have them memorized, be familiar with them, be familiar with what sounds are associated with them. We have I, which is the script A and the lowercase capital I. And this one is the I sound in words like write, bide, cry, aisle. We have ow, which is the script A and the a horseshoe U sound in a word like cow, town, out, bow. And then the last one is going to be probably the most common time that you'll see that open O symbol. And this one is the oi sound in a word like boy, foil, oink. And so these ones you'll probably just need to kind of become familiar with, get used to using. And these ones are conventionally written in this way using these symbols. So even if the way you say it is a little bit different, we still conventionally use the same symbols to refer to them because it's more about the direction of the movement in your mouth as opposed to the exact placement of these diphthongs in your mouth. The other two you'll notice um, are 
discussed on page 37 in your book um, because your book will use A and O as single vowels, individual vowels. But for most speakers in most dialects of American English, we actually pronounce these as diphthongs, um, which look like A with the E and the short capital I, and then O with the O and the horseshoe U. Um, you can use either transcription in this class and you will see both examples. So you should be familiar with the fact that a pure E and then the EI, the A, <clears throat> um, diphthong and then the O and the O diphthong, both they refer to the same sound. So whether it's single or whether it's a diphthong, they're both referring to the same thing. There's just different conventions that are used. So you might see examples of either one. I encourage you to sort of pick one and stick with it just for consistency's sake, but you will see both of them in practice. So you should be familiar with the fact that they're referring to the same sounds. What diphthongs look like if we put them onto the vowel chart, you'll notice that it's just a starting point and an arrow. And this is because they're more about the direction of the sound they're moving toward, because every time we pronounce vowels, they're gonna be made slightly different in our mouth depending on the sounds they're next to or how quickly you're saying them, you may fully reach that second sound or you may not. Or if you're speaking very slowly, maybe you'll go past it. But the point is that you're going toward that second symbol, which is why we use these conventionally, regardless of the exact sound that's produced. So with an I, you have the script A and the lowercase I because you're moving towards that I sound. And maybe you're going to get all the way to E, maybe you're not, but you're going to notice that it's that directionality and that's gonna be why we're using that symbol. So to close out talking about vowels, if we look back at our American English vowel chart, you'll notice that all of these main distinctions are visible here. The diphthongs will not show up. On your blank chart, you'll see that there's little spots to fill in for your own notes, for your own practice. But you can see at the top, we have the front, central, and back, so the backness um, columns. We have our high, mid, and low rows that are labeled on the left. You have your tense vowels in the outer areas in the white space, and then all of the lax vowels in the gray out space in the middle. And then the rounded ones has that dash box around it to refer to the ones that are rounded versus the ones that are not rounded. So all four of these are listed in the chart and they focus specifically on our descriptions for American English vowels. So this is why I would like you to use this particular chart as you're studying and as you're getting used to using these vowels. So again, these resources posted on Blackboard, these are the links for them again. They have ways for you to click through and listen to vowels as well. I highly encourage you to practice practice, practice, looking at the symbols, saying the sound, listening to example words, listening to the sound to correspond that and get sort of that rote memory and some of that muscle memory associated with it as you're saying the sound. Annoy the people you're living with as you're practicing these. This is the best way to, to gain command over these symbols and the sounds they're associated with. So again, questions, you can email me, schedule office hours, come to class with questions. We're going to have a lot of practice in our next synchronous class. So you'll have a chance to bring those questions, talk through them. We'll be able to work in small groups and I'll be able to answer as many questions as possible about them as we're going through these different examples. So have a great day and keep practicing.